that's really great. Thank you very much. And so we've got some good time for discussion. And whenever you hear the words complexity and the difficulties of the solutions that's being sought from panelists and others, I'm sure there's a lot of conversation and debate. So does anyone, rather than me starting, anyone in the audience want to start with some questions? Thanks. Thanks. Bruce. Thanks, uh, thanks, Elmar. Uh, this question is for, for Phil and, and in fact, to some extent, Giselle. I'm just curious, um, we heard yesterday uh, Indisha, uh, Shea Felix spoke from Indisha and he talked about um, the challenges of dealing with customs authorities. And, and I know there are a lot of people in this room that have opinions about the advantages and disadvantages of postal customs clearance. But um, with this, the increases in, in volumes um, inbound and outbound, I'm just curious as to what's being done at an international level um, to deal with some of these pain points in, in foreign markets for the outbound, Brazil, Russia, um, and also from the US Customs uh, point of view, um, you're obviously dealing with the inbound, a de minimis will help uh, increasing the, the, uh, the amount, but I'm curious as to what's being done in terms of the manpower and, and um, you know, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with that, that challenge? Thank you. Go first. Okay. Um, this, this down, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, thanks for the question. I think there's, there's a lot in that question. I guess I can talk first about what, what we're doing in terms of the amount side. Um, uh, as you might know, well, I guess internationally, let's just do that first. I guess so, so the EU has already passed their regulations, um, which within a few years will require advanced data on, on, on items. Um, and there was a big uh, debate about what was covered by that. So I, I think I think now it'll be all packages. Um, so they've done that as as a block. Um, the UPU um, has been a great partner. They've put a lot of tools in place to help countries produce advanced data sets for for customs and security purposes if it's acquired by the country of destination. I think they've worked very well on that, and this is something then that any country can use. So you've got the platform out there that the UPU has helped put in place. Um, the messaging between the UPU and the World Customs Organization has already been established. So in other words, there are standard messages in place for your electronic exchanges so that when a country wants to start receiving it, the post knows what they have to do. So the, the data set is there. The UPU is helping to put the tools to collect and transmit the data in for the post. So I think these building blocks are really very important fundamentally. Um, and then from our standpoint, uh, we're doing pilots. Um, we're, we're ready to go. I mean, I think um, in terms of, of, of outbound, um, USPS can, can go anywhere. Uh, we're getting all the data that, that on all their outbound packages. So they're ready to go. And we're ready to receive any, any data in, inbound. Um, you know, our targeting is probably more ahead of a lot of countries in terms of what we can do. So we're just sort of applying what we do in cargo and express to the postal shipments for, for that. And then we're testing it also operationally. So I think. I think we're, we're pretty well, I feel good about it, and I, and I think um, USPS does too, in terms of we've got the capability of putting there. But these, have, these things had to be in place before we could sort of mandate something. Um, and so from the regulatory side, again, we're looking at it. Um, CBP is really in charge of, of that piece in terms of what's going to be covered. Again, IAEA is, sort of, is sort of part of this in terms of what's competitive and what's not. But I, I got to say, with e-commerce, small packets are really a big part of the e-commerce world. So. We don't want to be bound by UPU sort of um, classification of, 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 of items. Um, so I think I think the advanced data is going to be key um, to this because, as you said, in terms of the volume and what we're coping with, if, if we can sort of uh, do more with data, that's going to help everybody. Uh, and I think that's going to be really important. Um, so, do you want me to read any of that? No, I was just, I was, am I off? I'm on. Okay. I'm just going to echo what Phil said around advanced data I think is critical. It's very important. Um, and when we get advanced data on the import side, we use it to help us build credibility and trust with, our, with the customs partners. And likewise on the export side, uh, trust is very important. So if you're sending product to a country and that country trusts that the, the, the labels, the quality of the data you provide is good, then then the process goes smoothly and you provide a credible service to your customer that can be reliable. And it starts with capturing the data electronically upfront and, and sending that data in a timely fashion. So those are the key pillars to really building out a more efficient, robust customs process. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, you know, I've heard the, the great 
that in fact critical transparency. Um, well, I, I'd say I don't know any operator or postal company that is happy with the customs interaction. We have a slide of five points and they look terrific on Word. When you come down to practice, the, the customs officer sitting next to it just before the sorting centre. The post hate it, the carriers hate it, and none of it sort of works. It, there's, a, there's, an in, there's an inconsistency somewhere between the policy nicety and the practical reality of the, of the order. So are you talking about US customs or customs, yeah, customs generally, but yeah. not excluding the US I think we are trying. I think, again, I, I, with, with the trade partnership programs and with things like the automated data and on the passenger side, you know, you look at global entry, things like that. We're trying to make things easier where, where there is trust. I think Giselle has a good point about trusting your, 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 your traveler or trusting your importer. So we try, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about your experiences. If you have something that's specific, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna um, just say, in, in, um, in our experience with customs, we very carefully screen and provide free data on all of our shipments, and, um, and we have a 99.9% .9 compliance rate with customs. But from our large shippers, I'll just give an example of China. We reject, they know that we will not take items that have an intellectual property issue or that have a safety issue or that otherwise is banned. But we know that a lot of those um, products that we won't take um, still end up coming through um, the other channel. So did you just want to speak to that briefly? No, I think that's a good point about compliance. I think. Um, yeah, we've worked hard to sort of educate consumers on what you can send, what data you need to give us, what form you need to fill out. And, and often it's not a customs issue. It can be a, a, an issue with fish and wildlife, and someone who doesn't know what's required. This is why people get brokers and people who know what they're doing. So I, I think I think there is there is sort of a give and take. I mean, we try to do it, but you know, people have to do it. I, I mean, some of the postal forms we've seen have been, you know, a gift to somebody, you know, and well, Anything else from the floor? Yes, yes, please. Um, Claudia Swiss posed this question to uh, when you were anyone in the panel or maybe also in the audience. Um, the uh, package is from China, so uh, if you have a package that comes from Shanghai to Zurich, this is actually less expensive than a package from Zurich to Bern, which is about one hour away. <laughs> so uh, we have a, a growing challenge, let me put it like that. There, how, how do you deal with that? And how do you see how this is going to be allowed? Well, it's a permanently used type of problem, or what you're describing? Sorry? The, the problem you're describing, is it to do with the permanently used, or? Yeah, it's, it would be the same issue here yeah. in the United States yeah. where it would be less expensive to uh, send a package into the United States by ePack and that would be to send it somewhere in the United States. <laughs> well, I obviously there's been a lot of discussion about this and a lot has been written up about it. The terminal dues rate are established via the UPU, and I think Joe Murphy will be up here later, or he could address it as well. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, is that the price the consumer pays is not necessarily reflective of the rates that the operators pay each other or the cost of the service. So in many cases, a consumer may not see a shipping cost because the shipping cost is built into the price of the good. So it's a little misleading to compare the shipping rate that's presented to you 
with a domestic shipping rate that you would pull off of your published rate on your rate sheet from, you know, Bern to Italy, let's say. So I think there's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison. You're not actually comparing um, the same thing. And as, as we are quite familiar with in this industry, there's a lot of commercial rates that are applied for each other. So when you are talking to businesses, you do negotiate commercial rates. And likewise with the posts, we negotiate bilaterally, we negotiate commercial rates for each other as well. But there is a UPU standard terminal dues rates, which in many cases govern how we have to pay each other in that environment. Now, what you see as a consumer does not always reflect that rate. It, it may be less because some of the cost of that shipping is built into the product and the sellers are just trying to be more competitive and compete okay, with the local domestic markets. It may not be. It may be a, it, they may be a bilateral. They may have negotiated something differently. Yes, we do. It's possible they don't, right. I, I can't speak to that publicly right now. That's, that's sensitive information. Elmo, can I add to that? Um, so, so in our world uh, today, What's interesting is the emergence of consolidators and wholesalers who uh, typically have come out of the postal environment and are somewhat aware of those terminal due agreements and the bilateral agreements, and they're starting to market them to the, the large enterprise shippers. So uh, we facilitate that. So to give one example, I was looking at a facility in the London area, and there were packages from China labeled with a Hungary Post label injection into Brazil. I don't know how the tariff works behind that, mm -hmm. but someone figured it out. But I guess what's interesting for the future is um, one, of the, one of the weapons that we make available to, uh, to posts is for the ability for them to engage those large enterprise shippers directly or indirectly through private operators and to make all of their services available. Because one of the truths today is where terminal dues apply or punitive bilaterals are in place, typically they get dumped in the untracked services or the low-grade services, and they don't get delivered fast. And the number one beef of uh, cross-border consumers, and I think these are table stakes, are tracking yeah. and short delivery times. So the weapon is get the best of your services out there in your major uh, origins. So if it's China, take your services to China, either directly uh, or indirectly. So, um, Phil, in terms of the World uh, Customs Organization, I guess, are you seeing any movement around um, improving the de minimis for other uh, countries, such as the U.S. just did? Um, yeah, it's sort of outside of our lane in the sense that really um, it, it's a U.S. trade trade issue. I mean, we, we implement it, um, so but it does come up a lot in, with uh, trade agreements, like with the WTO, more than WTO. Um, but, you know, again, we, we implement it. Anything further? Okay. So, you know, we're seeing the importance of the topic. We're seeing the policy solution attempted to be put together. Um, there were people who were taking advantage of the arbitrage situations of terminal dues and other peculiarities. In some countries, the post delivers a fantastic competitive advantage because it's easier to deal with the customs. In other countries, the post and the custom are really at loggerheads and it's easy to go through a private carrier. So there's still an enormous amount of problems, number of problems to be solved in this area. But um, I guess we're hearing positive uh, um, indicators from our panel that uh, you know the solutions are coming together, and it's being driven because the market is so uh, great, and so that's a fantastic opportunity.
So thank you very much. We've got a break now. Is that correct, John? We do. Excuse me. Uh, we do have a break, and thank you for again for being on time. Um, we are scheduled actually for a, a, on your program a half an hour, but we'd really like to do it 15 again because we haven't actually uh, even even expanded a policy uh, panel um, following uh, with as many as seven speakers, and we're covering a lot of issues there. Uh, so so let's be prepared to please come back again in 15 minutes. So thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So. Are we still on tomorrow? <coughs>